Welcome to the Chemistry, Biology and Math Revision Hub. Today we are doing the Pearson at Excel International A-Level, Biology Unit 1 for January 2020. This is the part one video. I'll put the link to the part two video below in the description box. Let's begin with the first question. Question 1 says, Polynucleotides include DNA and messenger RNA. Some components of polynucleotides are found in both DNA and messenger RNA. Other components are found only in DNA or in messenger RNA. A Venn diagram can be drawn to represent this information. Components found in both DNA and messenger RNA are written in the part of the diagram where circles overlap. Complete the Venn diagram by writing the name of components in each part of the diagram. Components found only in DNA are thiamine as well as the sugar deoxyribose and components found in RNA only are uracil as well as the sugar ribose. And for DNA and RNA, both contain cytosine, guanine, adenine, as well as the phosphate. So since they wanted two components per section of the Venn diagram, two here, two here, and two here would be okay. So this brings us to the end of question one. Let's continue to question two. Question two, blood flows through the heart during the cardiac cycle. Which diagram shows the direction of blood flow through the vena cava? So for blood flowing through the vena cava, it's going to be A, we can see it's incoming here. The others are flowing either flowing out or flowing through different blood vessels. So the answer should be A. But B, which row in the table describes the blood flow through the pulmonary artery and the pulmonary vein? In the pulmonary artery, the oxygenated blood from the right ventricle flow through the pulmonary artery to be taken to the lungs, so it's flowing away from the heart. And then in the pulmonary vein, oxygenated blood from the lungs coming into the heart flows into the left side of the heart. So the answer here should be an A, because that and that correspond to the right answers. Moving on. In part C, the table describes the atrioventricular valves and the semilunar valves during the cardiac cycle. Which description is true for each stage of the cardiac cycle? So atriosystole, during atriosystole, of course, the atrioventricular valves are going to be open and the semilunar valves are going to be closed because here the atria is contracting, so blood has to flow into the ventricles and that is why we see these are going to be open while the others are closed. And uh, for ventricular systole, here the ventricles are contracting, so we know the atrioventricular valves have to be closed to prevent the backflow of blood from the ventricles into the atria, and the semilunar valves have to open so that blood can leave the ventricles into the specific blood vessels, which is the iota as well as the pulmonary artery. And in diastole, this is relaxation, so we expect the atrioventricular valves to open and the semilunar valves are going to close. So the answer here is going to be that. In part D, Describe how the events of the cardiac cycle change when the demand of body cells for oxygen increases. When there is greater demand for oxygen, the heart is going to be working harder and faster, so the cycle will become shorter, and then the ventricles contract more strongly to pump blood at a higher pressure in order for the organs to receive oxygenated blood at a fast enough rate. So this brings us to the end of question two. Let's continue to question three. Question three. Lactase is an enzyme that catalyzes the hydrolysis of lactose. The diagram shows symbols of lactase, lactose, and the monosaccharide of lactose. So the enzyme is lactase. We have lactose and we have the monosaccharide. They say which diagram shows the sequence of events for hydrolysis of lactose. Hydrolysis of lactose, this is when water is added and lactose is broken down into its monosaccharides, which are glucose and galactose. So it means for the hydrolysis reaction to occur, this has to bind into the enzyme to form an enzyme substrate complex, and then a reaction takes place, breaking down the lactose into the monosaccharides, and then the monosaccharides released. So we can see, if we look at the possible answers here, these are monosaccharides entering the enzyme, so that is wrong, and that is wrong. It leaves us with A and B, but when we see A, we can see the product is actually a disaccharide. It means there is no reaction that occurred at all. So hydrolysis did not occur, and therefore A is wrong as well. For B, the disaccharide lactose binds into the enzyme, and then a reaction takes place, and we can see the products are released as monosaccharides, so the answer should be a B. Next they say, 
Which of the following are the monosaccharides present in lactose? Of course, it's glucose and galactose, and the answer here should be a B. In B, they say the graph shows the energy changes for the hydrolysis of lactose with and without lactase, which is the enzyme. So we see this is going to be the hydrolysis with the enzyme, and the other is going to be the hydrolysis without the enzyme, because presence of an enzyme creates a pathway with lower activation energy, which is going to be this one here. So the activation energy for the catalyzed reaction is going to be R, and the activation energy for the uncatalyzed reaction is going to be R plus Q. So down here they say, which row in the table describes line P and identifies the letter that shows the decrease in activation energy due to lactase. Line P is the line without the enzyme, and the change that has occurred due to presence of lactase is going to be that the activation energy decreases by the magnitude, which is Q. So the answer is going to be C, as we can see. Moving on. The graph shows the relationship between substrate concentration and the rate of reaction of lactase. So we can see this is the curve for the reaction. The rate of reaction increases as the substrate concentration increases until a point when the rate no longer increases or remains constant, no matter how much you increase the substrate concentration. Explain why substrate concentration affects the rate of reaction. As the substrate concentration increases, there will be more particles that can collide, so there is a chance of having more successful collisions, and therefore the rate of formation of the enzyme substrate complex is going to be higher, and the rate of reaction becomes higher. However, a point is reached on the graph when it levels off because no matter how much the substrate concentration is increased, the rate of reaction is not increasing, and that is because all the enzymes have been saturated with the substrate, and so the reaction cannot proceed faster. So for the second point I said, the graph levels off when the substrate concentration is too high. This should be too high compared to the enzyme concentration. Enzymes are saturated, so the rate becomes constant. Moving on. The reaction rate V at each substrate concentration can be calculated using the formula V is equal to Vmax times S divided by K plus S. They've told us Vmax is the maximum rate. K is a substrate concentration when the rate of reaction is half the rate of Vmax, and S is the substrate concentration. So they want us to calculate V, which is the rate, at substrate concentration of 4 AU. If we go to the graph, we can see from here Vmax is 50. Now half of Vmax is going to be 25. So at 25, we can see the substrate concentration is 1.9 AU. So these are the values I'm going to use. So from the graph, K is 1.9 and Vmax is 50. We were given our S as 4, so just substitute the values in this equation here, and then I got Vmax is 50 times 4 divided by 1.9 plus 4, and this gave me 33.9, which I rounded off to about 34, or you could leave three significant figures, or just two significant figures, both are acceptable. So this brings us to the end of question 3. Let's continue to question 4. Question 4. Water is the solvent for the transport of sodium chloride and glucose in the blood. The graph shows the effect of temperature on the solubility of sodium chloride and glucose in water. So here we see for both actually, the higher the temperature, the higher the solubility of the two components in water. However, the relationship with sodium chloride is linear and there is little change in solubility over time. The one for glucose has a greater change in solubility over time. As we can see, the change is going to be exponential. So here they say compare and contrast the effect of temperature on the solubility of sodium chloride and glucose in water. When they say compare and contrast, they want you to talk about the similarities as well as the differences. So the similarities are solubilities of glucose and sodium chloride increase with increase in temperature. And then the differences are as the temperature increases, glucose has a greater solubility than sodium chloride. An increase in temperature enables glucose molecules to dissolve exponentially, while sodium chloride dissolves in a linear manner or linearly. You can see this is an exponential curve, while this is going to be a line. So moving on. Here they say the formula mass of sodium chloride is 58.44. They want you to calculate the molecular mass of glucose using the information in the table. So from the table, the atomic mass of carbon is 12, that for hydrogen is 1, and the one for oxygen is 16. So this is the formula of glucose. I have 6 carbons times 12, plus 12 hydrogens times 1, plus 6 oxygen times 16, 
and this gave me 180 as the molecular mass. In the next part, they say calculate how many times greater the molecular mass of glucose is than the mass of sodium chloride. So the one for glucose is 180. If I divide with the one of sodium chloride, which is 58.44, I got 3.08 times, and that is the answer there. So next they say, suggest why there is a difference in solubility of sodium chloride and glucose in water. If you remember the structure of glucose, it has a lot of OH groups, and those OH groups are going to form more hydrogen bonds with water, and we also because glucose is larger and has so many OH groups, its surface area can be surrounded by more water molecules to increase the solubility. So I said glucose molecules are larger than water molecules, and the glucose molecules have a lot of OH groups, so they can form more hydrogen bonds with water molecules. Moving on. Explain why fatty acids are less soluble in blood than glucose and sodium chloride. If you remember the structure of fatty acids, they have long alkyl groups, long nonpolar groups. Those nonpolar groups cannot interact with water properly because water is polar. So I said fatty acids are nonpolar, yet water is polar. So the fatty acids can't form hydrogen bonds with water molecules. Or you could say they cannot form enough hydrogen bonds with water molecules and therefore they are not going to be soluble. Another way you could say the fatty acids have long nonpolar parts which cannot form hydrogen bonds with water molecules and therefore they cannot dissolve in water which is a polar molecule. So this brings us to the end of question four as well as to the end of this video which is the first part for this paper. Thank you for being with us. Do not forget to subscribe. See you in the next video. Bye-bye.